and we're excited that you're on the call to hear what is the latest. And this is brought to you today by Bank of the James. So we wanna thank our sponsors for allowing this to take place as well. I know this year has been truly memorable, a memorable session, including uh, different locations where you met this year and all the COVID-19 uh, challenges and the different debates that you had, but we appreciate every single one of you for standing on the front lines for small business and to be pro-business. We appreciate that so much and uh, look forward to what you have to say today. Uh, so thank you again for continuing to work hard for our businesses and uphold a pro-business state. Uh, now uh, we're gonna go and to our invocation. And so if you would please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for watching over us and keeping us in your care during this time. We look to you for guidance and protection. Thank you for giving us your grace and your mercy by intervening on our nation and our state's behalf as we need you, Lord. Continue to guide our leaders and give them all that they need by equipping them with your armor and leading them by your hand. Speak through them today and surround us with your presence. We thank you for all your blessings that you provide and pray in expectation of your faithfulness to our great nation as we seek you first. We ask that you heal our land and be with our country. It's in your precious name we pray, amen. Amen. I'd like to introduce you to Bill Moss, who is our fearless leader. He is our Chamber of Commerce board chair this year, and we're excited to have him. He brings so much energy and so much knowledge to his position, and we're blessed to have him. Bill is sales manager of Foster Fuels Propane Division, and he does a phenomenal job. We usually say, uh, it's not where's Waldo, it's where's Bill, because Bill is everywhere. And uh, I don't know how he, he does what he does, but he continues to do a fabulous job and really supportive of our businesses and our business community. He continues to give back in so many ways and the latest is Meals on Wheels and their partnership with them. So we just appreciate you and all that you're doing for us as a region, uh, region-wide. So we welcome Bill and uh, appreciate you today on the call and thank you for introducing our legislators and our moderator today. Thank you, Wendy. I could uh, never keep up with you, but I try. I do my best, <laughs> the Energizer Bunny. <laughs> so we're excited to have uh, Senator Steve Newman with the 23rd District, Delegate Kathy Byron, the 22nd District, Delegate Terry Austin with the 19th District, and Delegate Wendell Walker with the 23rd District today. Uh, we're excited about it. We've been uh, excited with anticipation. But first, we'd like to mention something about uh, Senator Newman. Uh, Senator Newman is a, uh, he'll be our first speaker today, and he'll be, he's the Vice President and Member Board Directors for Delta Star. Now, his education, I, I have to lean toward you with that because we both graduated from, we called it Lynchburg College back then, Senator Newman, but we, uh, so I, I read for Lynchburg, right, college? <laughs> so uh, anyway, we, uh, we appreciate that and being a local community. Uh, he has so many, numerous accolades, many, 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 many that we won't have time to mention. It's one I would like to mention though as well, is, uh, is uh, it stood out to me uh, because Wendy said pro-business and that's what we're all about here, supporting our business community, the leaders in our Bedford area. And uh, he was rated at one of Virginia's most pro-job and pro-business senator members. And so that's what we're looking for to support uh, who we have on this call today and all of our members. So um, what I'd like to do then also too then is mention, I'm gonna mention everyone, then turn it over to Pam uh, Bailey. But anyway, mention too that uh, another pro business uh, and that's uh, Delegate Kathy Byron. And she's a longtime business owner as well. And, and uh, she was uh, in the 22nd uh, legislative district elected in 1997. And she represents many counties, Bedford being one of those. And uh, she's on the Labor Committee and Technology Committee and numerous other committees. And, and we're excited about that technology, technology Committee in the Bedford area because we, we, we love to have some, some good broadband and she's on that council as well. So we're excited to have her with us as well today. 
and then also Delegate Terry Austin. Uh, Terry, uh, brother uh, Terry Austin, he's uh, he's member of also two numerous committees and subcommittees pertinent to our growth in the Bedford area. So uh, we we look forward to hearing from him as well. And um, he's also too um, president and CEO of Austin Electrical Construction. So another uh, person pro business and understands business. And that's what I like so much too uh, about our members on today because they understand business. And that's what, that's what we need in our economy and our small businesses are so important to us. Uh, he's also uh, uh, been a volunteer rescue, uh, Finn Castle volunteer rescue squad, lifetime contributor. And so we have many on the call today that give back to the communities in many different ways. And then Delegate Wendell Walker, we're excited about today too. Uh, just numerous subcommittees from, from health to social services and others. And so uh, we just appreciate all these represent, representatives being with us today with the diverse backgrounds that they have because it, it marries so well with the Bedford Area Chamber with our diverse economic and workforce development uh, that we're trying to work for, for our community and for our business leaders. And uh, we just appreciate our distinguished guests being on the day, uh, making these things happen for us. So what I'd like to do is then just turn, uh, turn our meeting over today to, uh, to Pam Bailey. And Pam is uh, Bedford County, uh, with the Bedford County Office of Economic Development and Chair of the Bedford Area Chamber of Commerce Government Affairs Committee. Uh, she'll be moderating for us today. Thank you, Pam. Good morning, and thank you, Bill. Good morning, everyone. And this morning, I really appreciate everyone's time and being here, all the delegates and Senator Newman for being here. Uh, we are going to start it off with them each giving their own take of the General Assembly session. They have seven minutes to do that, a little reminder. And then following that, we will be able to have a, uh, a brief Q&A session based on questions that were asked prior to this event today. So they kind of, we ask these questions ahead of time. So anyway, I'd like to kick it off with Senator Steve Newman, our Senator from the 23rd District of Virginia. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Pam. Good to see you, uh, even in these conditions and also to, uh, to Bill. We're grateful for what you're doing for the chamber and also for your business. Uh, Wendy, thank you for putting this together. What a great job you guys uh, have done. I just want to start out by first uh, thanking our team. You know, in Central Virginia, in Bedford, we're very, very fortunate to have the team we, we have. Uh, when you talk about people being pro-business, uh, you look at Kathy Byron, who is uh, just a fantastic business leader uh, on the Commerce Committee, a runner on business for many years. Terry Austin, a fantastic leader who is on the Appropriations Committee. Uh, Wendell Walker, uh, who has run businesses for a long time, understands apprenticeships. What a great team. So uh, thank you all for sending that team uh, back up uh, to Richmond. Uh, let me just go through an overview, really, of what uh, happened in the General Assembly session and talk to you a little bit about where we are today. First, uh, most of you know that it was a trying year when it came to business. Uh, we had about 34 bills that came through that were specifically designed to be anti-business. They were bills that uh, were put in to allow uh, businesses to be sued for a number of different items, uh, the anti-discrimination type lawsuits, but also just many that allow for trouble damages and otherwise. And then you get to those core anti-business bills, which included uh, the project labor agreements just to bolster up the uh, unions in Virginia, the prevailing wage uh, bill, which uh, Senator Saslaw introduced in the Senate of Virginia, collective bargaining, which will allow local governments to enter into collective bargaining, which would be devastating for taxpayers, but just also an encouragement for more unions to come into our Commonwealth. And probably the worst of all those bills was the minimum wage bill. When it came to those bills, I know that uh, each one of our members were very much opposed to those as they tend to be very much pro-business. But when it came to minimum wage, it was uh, quite a, uh, an effort. Uh, they were kind enough to allow me to serve on the conference committee, uh, which we made that bill just slightly better. Uh, so basically, as a result of the conference committee report, uh, we put out a, a, uh, a, an idea of taking a pause after this thing gets to 12.50 an hour, uh, doing a full-fledged study between now and the time uh, we get to that point, 
so that we can understand the real damage that it's going to do to Southwest Virginia and Central Virginia. Know this, that most of our employers currently pay a minimum wage. Many, of course, most pay a living wage. Uh, this is a minimum wage that will allow some of our beginning workers the opportunity to be employed, and the really is going to be quite devastating. All of us signed on asking the governor to veto these bills during the special during the uh, veto session. He did not. Uh, he did put forward some uh, amendments to delay it, which really were just exacerbating the problem. Uh, and so uh, most of us uh, were opposed to uh, to those items. So. Uh, quite a year when it came to the anti-business uh, items that are out there. Uh, this session, uh, we had a number of other bills uh, that uh, would allow for uh, more, in my opinion, fraud in voting. Uh, you're going to see that we've taken away uh, basically uh, the requirement that you have an ID, ID when you vote. Uh, we took a step backwards, in my opinion, as it related to illegal immigration uh, by allowing a certain kind of a driver's license that uh, the governor even amended it to make it worse, to make it look exactly like the driver's license and taking out all the requirements that it have uh, affirmative statements about not voting. Uh, we also had a bill that I think is going to be devastating for business throughout Virginia, which was uh, loosely called the Green New Deal for Virginia. Uh, it's going to raise your power rates. I'm delightful that uh, Larry Jackson and AEP and Dominion Power very much oppose those bills. They're going to uh, raise our rates for businesses. They're going to raise your rates for residential service. Uh, really quite a devastating deal for us. Uh, we also ended up with a transportation package uh, that I think uh, is going to raise uh, transportation costs at this time. There were certain parts of that bill that I think did it right. Uh, they were basically what I would term the Edwards portions. Some of the SAS law portions were a little, uh, little tougher. Uh, we were able to block a few things. So we had some successes this year with some of our Democrat friends helping us. Uh, one was the uh, mandated sick leave pay, which during this COVID-19 time would have been devastating to require not just sick leave, but it would require vacation time for every small employer, which would have been devastating to us on the last day of session, we were able to, uh, to kill that. Also, Senator Sasslaw and others had bills this year to finally just do away with portions of the right to work law. And we were able to work with a couple of Democrats, uh, most of them from far eastern Virginia, uh, to do away with that bill. That was a very close vote. The unions pressed hard for that vote. We were able to get that uh, bill taken care of. So uh, good news there. Uh, also, um, there was uh, implementation of what's called a fair share. Uh, and uh, in my opinion, that's just a watered down version of the anti right to work uh, law. When it comes to education, I know all my friends on the phone here are very much uh, interested in uh, solid education, both public and private. Uh, we did have a bill this year through the budget that uh, basically cut back on our ability to have our online classes for uh, Liberty University and also for uh, Lynchburg College or uh, University, uh, uh, Lynchburg University uh, and others. That's an unfortunate move. And in what I really think is a slap at good teachers, uh, we uh, had a bill this year that uh, stopped the ability to get rid of a teacher because they're incompetent. And this is in K through 12, uh, really quite an unfortunate event. Um, we'll talk later, I'm sure, about what's been going on with governor's executive orders. I'll just say for now that uh, basically, as I see it, the governor has taken extraordinary powers and has done some very simple thinking, which is basically how do we close, but not that leadership complex thinking, of how do we reasonably open. So we'll talk more about that as we go along. So uh, Pam, thank you for the opportunity. I look forward to hearing my colleagues uh, as they summarize as well. Hi Pam, I didn't hear a word you just said. So if you were talking to me, <laughs> Um, I was on mute, so I didn't hear you. Um, are you ready for me? I still can't hear you. We're ready. Might be having some... Okay, I can hear you now. Are you ready? Yes. Ready. Okay, great. Well, it's wonderful to be with you here today by Zoom, which is very unusual in itself for all of us. I think it's our first chamber meeting that we did virtual like this. I um, want to thank everyone that put this together. 
Um, it's still weird for some of us that aren't using it a lot or learning to use it a lot more. Um, and certainly a great way to communicate, but not one that I want to do for very long. So hopefully we'll all be back in safe distancing and seeing each other in person. But um, first of all, I want to say ditto to everything that Senator Newman said. I always love when he goes before me. He does a comprehensive job on talking to you about the things that I care the most about and things that I think are most important to business. So um, what I will try to focus on is a little bit of the differentials between the House and the Senate, which I think are rather important. But um, it is true. We have a great team in Central Virginia, and I won't spend a lot of time talking about that. Steve summarized that very well. And we all have different unique um, areas, and especially in business, that we, um, we speak out on and understand more than some others. You know, the the House of Delegates was a very new year for us. Not only were we in the minority, but um, we also then when we came back to reconvene session had a very uh, challenging um, session of understanding how to operate under that minority during the course of the pandemic. So um, it's been a, um, an enlightening year. Um, I was elected, I was very um, um, proud to be elected, the Republican caucus chair. And with that, um, the thing that really stood out to me every day as I would get our calendar ready, which was part of the, um, you know, the duties of the caucus chair, looking at our calendar, being prepared for the floor and everything going on there, it was just incredible um, to look at the differences and what a difference in a year makes. And that's the difference in elections. Um, it was so um, crushing at times. I think many of us were, were almost um, depressed, if you want to call it that, because we were seeing so many changes that we knew and knew very well were going to be um, not very good for business in the coming years in Virginia. And it's certainly the laws that were passed um, were ones that, you know, certainly are going to cost business more to operate in Virginia and also change the way the businesses operate. So thinking about this past session, when we went to veto session, you know, with things going on, we hope that, you know, the far left agenda that they had put in place, you know, higher electricity rates, the minimum wage, some of those things that we felt were going to be the most detrimental to business might be um, vetoed or, or considered, you know, now in a different light and, um, and realize that rather than just putting a short delay in the effect of those that we would actually have those um, bills, you know, go away, but they didn't. And um, we found out on the House side that not only were we not able to debate most of the bills, and that's where I say the difference is I was very glad to see that the Senate had a much more robust debate going on on their floor and that they actually were able to work together with some of their senators to um, make some changes. And through the leadership of Senator Newman, um, they were able to affect the, um, some of those harsher bills and get some changes made. But in the House, that was a different story. Um, if we asked more than one question, sometimes you couldn't even ask one question. We were, um, we were through a procedure that passed the bill by and we weren't able to speak to it. And this happened time and time again from the floor. So um, in the future, we may need to do most of our discussion in what's called the morning hour. And that's when you just speak about any subject you want to, and they generally don't stifle you. But we have to remember who's in control, and they're using that control very much um, in the House delegates in every procedure that they do. This past session, they um, didn't communicate with us very well, but they were working on a procedure that would have allowed for electronic voting. So we really didn't know up until the day we got there what the final decision was on that. And not only is it against the law, um, it brings a lot of concerns to mind about the power of the Speaker of the House that she felt constitutionally that she had in this situation and what other laws might um, be considered something that would override the Code of Virginia. So it was very concerning to many of us that that, that was going to take place and they debated it. Um, not very long, I think they knew at that point that they just didn't have the votes um, to, for the supermajority to get it through. But the concern is next year they will have votes to be able to get it through in a, um, a normal pattern of a five-day um, bill hearing. So there's a lot of different things that are going on. The bills that we had this year 
Um, I, someone asked me about good bills, and I was trying to think through, and I know there were a few, but it just seemed like they were outweighed by the agenda that was being passed that affected not only your Second Amendment rights, but affected um, business and the um, ability to do business and a lot of discrimination bills and bills that are going to give a lot of pause to businesses and require them to think about the legal challenges that they may have in the future. So I would say that it was probably one of the um, worst sessions that I've been through. I'm always blatantly honest with you. So I'm doing that right now. There's no, no way to really sugarcoat this thing. We went back to veto session hoping for more. And uh, the only thing that I think really helped was the fact that we um, prevented the governor from spending a lot of money on new programs. And we will go back and address that as we um, go forward and see how our revenues have been impacted. And there's a lot more that concerns me now, and that is with being able to get a plan to get us back open to business. And we may discuss that later um, in our conversation here, and I'd be very anxious to talk about that and, and the necessity of doing that in a safe manner. But um, all in all, we will continue to fight for you. We've always been there to fight for you. We've um, um, you know, tried to bring common sense into something that didn't make any sense, but um, we didn't prevail this year. So I'm very sorry for that. And we will continue to work with you and do everything we can for our businesses. But thank you for giving us an opportunity to share with you today. Thank you. I'm off mute now. <laughs> you got it, Pam. Oh, uh, sorry about that earlier. I believe that was a user error. I didn't realize I had muted myself. <laughs> so I'd like to thank previously Senator Newman and now Delegate Byron, but now we'll turn it over to Delegate Austin from the 19th District. Good morning. Good morning, Pam. Thank you, Pam. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to thank Wendy and her staff and Bill, the chamber, for putting this uh, video conference together today. I regret that we can't meet in person and have the breakfast that we typically have and get to socialize and interact with our colleagues and friends in the business community. But uh, we'll do it the best we can this way. Uh, uh, it's always tough following our good senator, and uh, he, he summarized it very well. Our delegation works together extremely well led by him, the senator's uh, the leader of that group, and he does a phenomenal job, and uh, he summed up everything very well. Uh, I will say that when I went into General Assembly, we had a 16-seat margin, and uh, we're certainly living under a different world, and I call it the rule of 55. That means there are 55 uh, Democrats and 45 Republicans in the House, and it has changed things dramatically, especially our approach to pro-business. Uh, you know, they, the, the Democrats said they would undo everything we had done in two days, and that's just about correct. That's pr practically what they've done. Uh, this year, uh, you know, I serve on transportation, and one of the most egregious bills that I saw, uh, a colleague of ours, uh, a Republican, that uh, blocks them from the Eastern Shore, had what was called a driving privileges card, and it was very tightly uh, drafted and, and uh, it was self-funded, uh, the cost associated would cover the cost to implement. Uh, and Delegate Tran presented House Bill 1211, which came through a subcommittee of transportation that I sat on. And uh, <clears throat> I was able to get a bill killed uh, in subcommittee. And the bill basically prohibited any information to be shared to ICE or any other, or state police or any, anyone else trying to get information on these individuals and their driving privileges. It went as far as to say the commissioner of the DMV had the right to deny sharing information through a subpoena of a federal or state judge. And when I pointed that out, when, I, when we went in and sat down in subcommittee, we were handed a 17 page amendment to the bill. So, you know, we sat down in the subcommittee and were handed this amendment. And so I had the privilege and opportunity to look through it very quickly and I found that paragraph and pointed that out and I was able to get the bill killed. However, uh, in, uh, the bill was brought back up. That was on the Tuesday evening at four o'clock. On Friday morning at eight o'clock in the transportation full committee, the bill was brought back up. Uh, I was able then to get our colleagues to pass the bill by for the year. But there was a bill on the Senate side, Senate Bill 34, and it was passed. And, and uh, it's going to require 95 full-time equivalent positions in the DMV just to help implement the processing of these individuals. And the costs are going to be passed along to us, the people who have to do a retake on their uh, uh, 
learner's permit test or your driving test or things of those nature, there's a $5 additional charge to be added to those uh, licenses. So, uh, you know, Delegate uh, Blossom's bill would have been $200 initially, $50 every two years to renew, and all that got wiped away, and those costs are now to be borne by us, the individuals who have uh, uh, legitimate driving privileges and who are citizens of the Commonwealth. I tried to get an amendment put on the bill uh, that would say that the individuals who get these driving privileges would have to be on a road to citizenship within two years. And, and then they, and within the next two years, after this license was renewed, within the next two years, if they did not become citizens, then that license would be revoked. Um, was not successful with doing that, unfortunately. Um, Senator Newman and I worked together on an airline incentive fund. I don't know that you all know, but in Roanoke, at Roanoke Regional Airport, there are about seven or eight air carrier airports in Virginia. Those are airports that have passenger service, not general aviation airports. Lynchburg, Roanoke, uh, Weir's Cave, uh, Dulles, Richmond, uh, are air, air carrier airports. Uh, Roanoke, for instance, 70% of everyone who flies out of Roanoke's airport service area goes somewhere else to fly. And they're going to Greensboro. They're going where the rates are cheaper and there's better service. 60% of Lynchburg's service area goes somewhere else to fly. So the Senator and I uh, put forth an airline incentive fund that would appropriate funds to try to help recruit air service to airports. It has to be proven to be sustainable. Um, there's other metrics there that they have to meet, but we're trying to do things. The Commonwealth has an investment in our airports, and I think we should try to promote and encourage our citizens to use our airports and to grow that service. And in doing that, that'll help grow economic development opportunities. We know that in the Roanoke region in particular, that we're losing a lot of opportunity from the West Coast because it takes two days basically to get back to the West Coast. So we think that uh, this incentive will help encourage and promote economic development in Virginia. Um, Steve also spoke of the new Green Deal. That concerns me tremendously. Um, not only the additional cost to us, the consumers of electricity, but also the cost of potential jobs. Uh, the carbon footprint that they're trying to reduce Biomass is a major interest of theirs, and they're attacking biomass because they know that electricity is being generated by Dominion and other producers through a biomass. Uh, not only is biomass uh, being used in electric, electric generation for public service, it's also being used at West Rock Corporation in Covington, which I represent, who has 1,100 jobs. And they generate 100% of their electricity through biomass and that's a waste product. That's a byproduct of what they actually use. They're a huge industry. Our forestry uh, business is the largest industry in Virginia, as we all know. But if they, uh, and, and, and we supplemented this biomass facility with uh, economic development incentives years ago, a few years back, to help promote and create it. And now uh, this new Green Deal could basically kill that. It was going to shut down Virginia City coal which is an eight year old coal fire generation facility in Virginia city. And, and that, faci that facility alone generates $80,000 million, $80, a year in revenue to the locality. So, you know, a huge, uh, huge economic incentive for the locality. And, and, and they were going to basically mothball it. Well, we would have continued to pay for that facility because it's built into the race structure of Dominion Power. So there are a lot of things that are being done that, and we were able to salvage that on the Senate side. Uh, the Senate fortunately uh, used some good, uh, good vision and we were able to keep the Virginia City coal facility alive and not mothball that. And we thank the Senate for doing that. We couldn't do it on the House side, we tried. But we, we just ran into a stone wall. Kathy will tell you, uh, you know, our, uh, the, the, the majority of Democrats on our side are not agreeable to any kind of concessions or reasoning whatsoever. They're just set in pushing through their agenda that they don't care. But um, we were fortunate to get some things worked out, uh, more so on the Senate side than on the House side. 
But once again, I, I thank our delegation, uh, Kathy, Steve, Wendell, myself. Uh, we miss Scott Garrett. Scott was a good friend. Uh, uh, he worked on appropriations. I now serve on appropriations. But um, we thank you all for what you do. We thank you for allowing us this privilege to speak before you today. And uh, we just thank our delegation for the hard work. Thank you so much, Delegate Austin. I appreciate all your time this morning. And now we're going to turn it all turn it over to uh, Delegate Wendell Walker with our 30, 23rd district. Good morning, Wendell. Great. Uh, thank you, Pam, Wendy, and the uh, Bedford Chamber for putting this together. It would be great to be in person there because I feel like we just have a better connection uh, when we're with our friends and supporters out here. But uh, since I'm the freshman here and the new guy on the team, um, I will uh, I'll make a few comments here. I would have to agree with uh, uh, Terry Austin and uh, Kathy that this was probably a very, uh, or maybe, maybe one of the most partisan sessions that I've seen and actually been a part of, having been down to the General Assembly off and on for over the last 20 years. It was a very uh, anti-business type of uh, session uh, on the House side. Certainly it was anti-family, a lot of the, uh, uh, pro-family issues that uh, Delegate Kathy Byron had worked so hard on for many, many years. It was just, um, it, it was really heartbreaking to see uh, where the governor and where the leadership of our uh, house was um, destroying uh, so many of these bills and the lack of respect for the unborn. And of course, we saw the battle with the Second Amendment. So many of the sanctuary cities across Virginia uh, were pushing uh, for the Second Amendment rights. We had a very large turnout there uh, on gun lobby day, over 20 something thousand people, which made a very strong political statement uh, nationwide. But that was what we're dealing with. Uh, the Democrats definitely had their- <laughs> pretty tough. I serve on the uh, health uh, welfare institutions as well as transportation there with uh, Terry Elston. And I certainly appreciate Terry's um, leadership and support here uh, being first year on transportation. Of course, one of the things that uh, came out of the transportation budget, and we all knew this was coming, it was hard about them, but that was the increase in the gas taxes and some other regulations. And, and Terry alluded to those just uh, a few moments ago. But the, I think one of the biggest things, and having been a, um, in both the private and public sector work uh, for all my life, I'm, I'm retired now, but uh, you know, the right to work was, is very important uh, for Virginians. And it's always been uh, an important issue to keep us up and, and number one, uh, in the highest level uh, throughout our nation as far as bringing businesses in and providing good jobs. You know, one of the things that was very disturbing was uh, when we passed the collective um, bargaining for localities so they could actually do uh, bargaining here regarding wages and things like that. So I think this is, is <laughs> the issues we have to deal with going forward. I don't know, um, hopefully in the future, those can be reversed uh, at some point. But um, then again, I uh, also want to say a special thank you to Senator Steve Newman. We all talk about Steve's leadership through the years and certainly um, during this reconvened session, we know where the governor was on um, the HB 29, uh, which is a house bill. He put in the language or put in the bill uh, to move our May um, and June elections to November. Well, this was totally unacceptable and un unconstitutional in my mind. I was very aggressive in fighting for this on the house side, I even went to the leadership and, and, and worked with them to try to, uh, to allow the localities to keep these elections. Um, and at one point we did, uh, the vote came up and uh, we were able to win, but then um, one of the Democrats came back and voting on the um, other side was able to bring it back up. We lost that uh, battle. But then on the Senate side, I was texting back and forth with Senator Newman and thanks to his leadership and a few Democrats, we were able to maintain our May election. So May 19th here in the city of Lynchburg, uh, we will be able to have our city council elections. This is very important because the local leadership is important to 
us here in our communities, just like the supervisors there in Bedford County. Um, and also I want to say uh, a special thank you to Delegate Kathy Byron's leadership and the caucus because because of her leadership, we were able to stick together on many of these major fights, uh, these bills that were coming out. And it's nothing more than the Democrat agenda, um, which was, like I said earlier, anti-family, anti-business. But um, um, I also want to uh, mention, uh, Terry touched on this, the, the voter, uh, I mean, the, uh, the driver uh, license here for uh, undocumented uh, people. You know, now um, when you go to vote in November, you're not gonna be required to provide an ID, whereas everything we pretty much do in life and business, whatever, you're required to provide an ID. I mean, this is just totally unheard of. Uh, of course, we know where the Democrats are going with this. And this is a very political um, action that was taken there. You know, uh, regarding our, our voting rights, um, it's gonna be a little bit different come November. Uh, so you can um, uh, go up and vote uh, with no excuse and no excuse voting. Uh, you can, uh, you can uh, also request your ballot and uh, vote. Uh, you can register and vote um, pretty much within the same day there. So um, a lot of these things are constitutionally concerning to me, um, but there again, these are battles that we have to fight each and every day. But I think in closing, um, the Central Virginia, especially uh, you guys there in Bedford, we're so blessed to have a great leadership team uh, representing the other great folks of Central Virginia here. So Senator Newman, Delegate Kathy Byron, Terry Austin, uh, others of us out here, we appreciate, greatly appreciate you know, the opportunity to work with you, share with you, and help you in any way that we can. Thank you all so much for having the time today. We do have a few minutes left over to ask each of you a question, maybe two questions. And uh, we have two minutes to answer each of them. And um, so we'll go on, we'll start with Senator Newman. The first question, and these were, uh, like I said earlier, were asked ahead of time. How can Virginia move wisely forward in reopening? Well, thank you, Pam. And thank you to all my colleagues. Well done um, on this as well. Um, you know, I think Virginia, like I said before, uh, has an opportunity, has an opportunity to lead uh, with science and also with a mentality that we really have got to find a way to think more complex and start to find a way to open up safely as opposed to what we've seen from the governor is a daily almost by leading by press conference where we've had uh, press conferences come out and then uh, I know Kathy and uh, and Terry and uh, Wendell have had to go back and say governor staff what, what did you mean in other words you made the announcement we really need the meat of what that means. And we've really struggled to get that uh, time and time again. But you know, now's the time to look at what the CDC has come up with in regards to how to open up safely and start thinking about how we can get more of these business open, but doing it in a way that protects our seniors and protects some of our long-term uh, living uh, uh, groups. Uh, I believe that if the governor were to uh, do what I think some other states have done and said, we're going to make sure that we're using the PPEs, uh, that we're taking the social distancing, uh, doing it correctly, we could actually restart part of Virginia's economy. When you look at the numbers that have come out uh, for new cases, which Sarah and my office puts up on Facebook on a continual basis, a lot of information that she's putting up as well, you find that our caseload really has come to a a peak and there's very few new cases. And we also, the Department of Health never shows the number of people that have recovered. For the most part, uh, the cases in Central and Southwest Virginia, we've had a number, they've peaked out pretty well and they're starting to decline. But when you look at those people that have recovered, many if not most of them are already recovered. So I'm hoping that what we're gonna find from the governor is less of this leadership by press conference, more the complex thinking that'll allow us to get our economy going and make sure that we're also kept uh, in a healthy way. So we're hoping that uh, the governor will begin that process uh, in the next uh, next few weeks. Great, sooner rather than later, maybe. <laughs> um, the next question is for Delegate Byron, and it's more of an opinion question. It says, "What do you think of the governor's executive order that shuts down businesses that he deems non-essential?" I 
think you're muted. Don't hear you. We don't hear you. There you go. Maybe. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Um, you know, I'm not confident the governor has acted within his statutory um, authority to impose all those restrictions he's put into place. There's already several lawsuits that are starting to be created from those that, um, you know, believe that he has not acted within his authority. You know, I think at a minimum that it's time for businesses um, to be able to demonstrate their ability to reopen in a safe manner. You know, I want to give a shout out to a couple of businesses in Bedford, and I know there's many more like that, so I don't want to offend anyone on the call. Foster's, you know, is always a great um, business helping the community, but um, there's some new businesses that I worked with on the Tobacco Commission. Uh, one is Light Sheet, and my understanding is they're, they've been working for several weeks now on some UV lighting that's going to be used in a lot of our industries to help maintain um, hygiene and maintain a germ-free environment um, in the coming year, you know, as we still try to make sure that we have a safe environment for folks um, until we, you know, finally get to a point of being able to properly treat or vaccine people. Um, and the other one is Nanosap. They have been doing um, fantastic work with their products as well. And I think this is a great time for businesses to shine and show their innovation and be able to really show government. I don't think that our, gov our governor certainly has not consulted with any of us that I'm aware of. Um, and that's sad because I'm not sure where he's getting his information, but if he listens to the businesses and tries to um, listen to the things that they have in place to be able to open and keep their customers and businesses safe, I think that there would be um, a great opportunity for them to open up a lot more businesses. And, you know, we're not a one size fits all. We see in rural Virginia what's going on. The hospitals are a great example. Um, th there's a whole floor closed on the Roanoke Memorial Hospital. People are laid off and yet I understand they have no patients. So we need to have a lot more complex thinking on this and get back to work. Thank you so much. Uh, the next question we have is for Delegate Austin. Um, it says, we have jobs available in the region, but unemployment is paying more than having a job right now. Mm -hmm. How long are the additional unemployment benefits expected to last? Okay, thank you, Pam. <clears throat> I agree. Uh, unemployment is paying more than some of the jobs offer, which is uh, not a good thing today. We need people working, not laid off and uh, sitting at home. Uh, depending on the earnings, the benefit amount provi amounts provide, provided by the Virginia Unemployment Commission range from $60 per week for 12 weeks to a maximum of $380, $378 per week for 26 weeks. The CARES Act also provides an additional $600 per week on top of whatever a person should normally receive in their state, limited to the, to the next four months which expires on July 31, 2020. Um, so as you know, a lot of people had the mindset, I was speaking with an individual, a friend of mine, a colleague who's a legislator uh, from Southwest Virginia, and uh, he's a dentist and he's starting his business back up today. And he called one of the individuals who works for him, a hygienist, and she said, you know, I homeschool my children. I'm just gonna stay home. And, uh, you know, that's unfortunate that people have that mindset. So, you know, I think he's just going to allow her to stay there. And I'm not sure she'll be called back when the opportunity presents itself. Um, you know, that's, that's the unfortunate side of this. I understand what the governor is doing. I understand he's trying to err on the side of safety. But I agree with Senator Newman. I think regions of our state, uh, Kathy mentioned Carillion Run at Memorial. I serve on that hospital board. We had three COVID patients in the hospital last year week. We have a whole floor dedicated to COVID patients. And uh, we did that so we could provide and have a facility to accommodate. We've just not experienced that need. Uh, the hospitals had to lay people off. We can't do elective surgeries. There are a lot of problems associated with this, but the jobs and the unemployment in the region are, are, are we need to get this portion of the state cranked back up. And, uh, you know, there are certain areas where I think uh, what the governor's doing is legitimate. And I think he needs to address that in that fashion. 
but in uh, in our region in particular, I think we need to go back to work. Uh, as you can see, I need a haircut. And <laughs> Kathy offered to do that, and so far I've denied, but I'm not so sure how long I can hold out. But uh, the unemployment- That was your Kathy, not me. <laughs> That's right, Kathy, not you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, Pam. I, I just think uh, unemployment is a big issue, and, I, and you know we were headed down a path of a socialistic mindset in Richmond this year. Unfortunately, I hate to say that; I don't even like to use that word. But I think it, this is only exacerbating that. I think this is only promoting and encouraging that mindset. But as you can see, uh, I think uh, what I'm watching on television, on, on some of the news stations. People are desperate to go back to work, and that's not a mindset of the, com of the United States and of the Commonwealth. Fortunately, our people want to work and want jobs. So right. hopefully it'll end soon. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you. The next question is for Delegate Walker. Uh, will the Commonwealth back off on implementation of any legislation passed during the last General Assembly, especially or particularly the early voting mandate? I'm sure if the governor has anything to do with it, no, they're not going to back off on any of the implications of legislation that was passed because this was their agenda to begin with. So many of these bills that were passed were certainly not the will of the people, but more of a political agenda, uh, which the governor wants to try to accomplish and establish as a legacy out here. But it's certainly not in the best interest of the Commonwealth. Um, so. You know, here's the thing that's sad is that uh, the leadership on the House side, I'm, I'm assuming on the Senate side as well, we sent letters to the governor uh, requesting uh, to be part of a plan to help and do what we can uh, through this uh, COVID-19 here. And you know what the sad thing is that the governor has not even responded to us. So he's not even acknowledging the fact that we as legislators are out here trying to do what's in the best interest of the Commonwealth and help you know, keep businesses open and, and working. Uh, it's not even responding to us. Um, so, you know, Terry mentioned the word socialism. You know, this is a, a thing that I fear the most is that we're in a state where socialism is becoming more real and real every day. And I certainly hope this is not the future. Now, regarding the, the state minimum wage increase, uh, I would have to go back and say uh, thank you to Senator Newman for his leadership on slowing this part of here. Whether or not that will change, I don't know. Uh, I heard that the, the governor most likely will be calling us back in session sometime this summer to readjust maybe the budget after we know what the numbers are at the end of the fiscal year. And of course, the, the early voting mandate, you know, I, I, I touched on that uh, a little while ago. You know, there again, this is all part of a political agenda here. We've got to get as many people uh, registered to vote, support the Democrat Party, become dependent on government, and that's not the way of life here in Virginia. So it's time to open up the doors to business, get people back together. This new task force that the governor is putting together, I sure hope that he'll put some CEO or some common sense business people on that can help advise him in the safe manner in which to put people back to work. Thank you so much. We have time for maybe one or two more questions. The next question is for Senator Newman. What do you think the effect of the increased minimum wage of $9 per hour is going to mean for businesses and how can businesses best prepare for that increase? Well, we had a lot of uh, hope and desire that uh, what uh, really a lot of our colleagues knew and that is that the, the, uh, the bill is going to have a very negative effect on most localities that are west of the fall line, the, uh, those in central and southwest, south side Virginia. We were able to convince some of our Democrat colleagues that they were problematic and that uh, led to the amendment that uh, we put on the floor that put the uh, 1250 pause. The problem uh, really, Pam, is, is that you're gonna have many individuals in central and southwest Virginia that are simply going to go without a job. Uh, we're seeing more automation. You're seeing more individuals that uh, can move their businesses uh, that are going to move their businesses. And so we're concerned about that. The other is kind of the canary in the coal mine uh, situation where I think you're going to be seeing where Terry Austin has worked so hard in the Botetourt and Roanoke County area, have been very successful in uh, getting more and more jobs in that area. But you're going to see those announcements uh, start to diminish. 
uh, as individuals see that as you move this uh, up to 1250 and then up to $15 an hour, uh, that uh, you're really going to have a compression uh, at the $15 an hour rate. And that's going to make it very difficult for some of these automotive workers and otherwise uh, to decide to locate in this area. So we're very concerned about where we are. Uh, we think a number of our de Democrat colleagues knew they were going to make a mistake. That's why they voted with some of us at a, for a pause at uh, 1250. We're only hopeful that when that occurs, that we can slow that curve down and protect many of our jobs in our area of Virginia. Right. Right. Um, maybe one more question. This is for Delegate Byron. As the duly elected representative, or as as duly rep, I can't talk. Don't. As duly elected representatives, do you believe that you have been informed to an appropriate degree on the evolution of the COVID-19 pandemic and state response? Well, that's a great question, and I appreciate you asking it. Um, unless we, we, we seem to hear any of the decisions on COVID ID um, when we listen to the governor on Facebook Live. You know, it's unfortunate, but um, the public and the, you know, the legislators all want to have um, information and be informed. That's how you make your decisions. Um, I, I talked to, and that's not a partisan issue. I talked to a, um, a Democrat senator from Northern Virginia because we were talking about the fact that the governor um, was questioned early on from all of us about having more data available. It's the data that the public is looking for to have some confidence on how they are going to proceed and how they are um, feel about protecting themselves and how the areas are doing. I, I'm not too certain that because of the fact that there wasn't that much data that the governor um, didn't put the information out there. And what's concerning is if the data is going to drive the decisions that are being made, um, there's less and less confidence yet because the data, while it's out there, shows you information that you don't know if, if the person was tested one day ago or if they were tested two weeks ago. Uh, we don't know what the recovery rate is. We don't know um, what's going on. So I think just like we've been hearing on the federal level, some of the, the testing that I think will be the most significant for everyone is going to be the testing that they do for the antibodies. That's supposed to be one that will be costing a lot less. You won't have to have symptoms in order to get that done and that may give us um, some pause. But the um, information that he has given us is from the very beginning has been very limited. And, um, and I feel like they weren't um, transparent for the public and allowing them to be able to see what was really going on in the state. And if it was because they weren't tracking it properly, then he had the authority, he's the leader, he had the authority to do that and he didn't. I appreciate everyone's time today. And if you that's, I think that's all the time we have right now for questions. But if you have, if you do have questions for your senator or your legislator, please feel free to reach out with them directly. Wendy may have um, their contact information. You don't have it, but at this point, let's turn it over to Wendy to for some closing remarks. Thank you so much. Appreciate everybody's time and support and all that you're doing again to serving our area, our region. We certainly appreciate it. We can't say thank you enough. You know, you're on the front lines and you are working hard for our businesses to continue to help us to be a state that's pro-business. And I know the work is hard and it continues, but you guys are the right people put in place and we just appreciate you so much. Uh, may you be blessed for all that you do.